What differs suicide and assisted death? Should people have an equal choice in life and death? To what degree can we make the choice for other people's lives? Hello, everybody. This is. Why did the podcast cross the road? Where today's topic is going to be life, death, and mercy. Otherwise, euthanasia. To discuss this complex issue, we have a special guest here today, Dr. Beatrice Krasovska. Welcome, Beatrice. Hi, thanks for having me. Glad to have you. So, this is a can of worms. So, let's start with what is euthanasia? Well, euthanasia or assisted death is essentially ending a person's life to end the suffering. And there can be different types of euthanasia, voluntary and involuntary. Voluntary euthanasia is having the choice to end the suffering, especially when it's a terminal illness like cancer. And also, the patient might want what is called a death by dignity, which would mean you would die before your loved ones could see you in a devastating state. But then there's non-voluntary euthanasia. That's right, and we'll be mostly focusing on the non-voluntary type in this debate here today. Not to be confused by involuntary euthanasia, in which the patient can give consent but does not because they either don't want to die or weren't asked. Essentially murder. And just a reminder that all of the debates here today are for debate and educational purposes and may not hold accurate to everyone's real opinion. So... You're pro-euthanasia? Well, yes, and I think as a doctor that may have influenced my choices. And how is that? Well, as a doctor, I've been in a lot of these situations. A while ago, actually, I was treating an 80-year-old woman with a terminal cancer. See, the thing is, you can say no one deserves death before it is granted to them easily. But when you see your loved one weighs only 80 pounds and is bed bound and eats through a feeding tube or screams in pain because no pain medications can calm them down or the toll it takes on the whole family is so devastating. Yeah, that that's got to be tough. So was the lady euthanized? Sadly, no, because it really wasn't an option at that time. And this was in a couple of years before 2016, so before it was legal in Canada. So, as a Canadian podcast, let's discuss the rates in Canada. There were 1,523 medically assisted deaths in Canada in the last six-month reporting period, a nearly 30% increase over the previous six months. Cancer was the most common underlying medical condition in reported assisted death cases, cited in about 65% of all medically assisted deaths, according to the report from Health Canada. Using statistics from Statistics Canada, the report shows medically assisted deaths accounted for 1.07% of all deaths in the country over those six months. That is consistent with reports from other countries that have assisted death regimes, where the figures range from 0.3 to 4%. Yes, exactly. And I think those stats are definitely consistent. I mean, the Netherlands, one of the first countries to legalize it, have, I think, around a 1,000 medical assistant deaths per year, too. Right, and as a doctor, you can see examples and how the technical effects of something like this or, or even how they might affect someone else, as in the case with abortion. Of course. Which brings us to our non-voluntary euthanasia. Oftentimes, we see certain mothers and parents choose to abort their baby because they were informed of their conditions. Yes, and this story doesn't come from me exactly, but I remember a case with a family where they had decided to abort their baby after finding out that their fetus had severe spina bifida and would be born paralyzed, severe, severely brain damaged, and with an exposed spine. 
They terminated their much wanted pregnancy in an instant and in its second trimester. So, when we have a situation like this, what is right? Well, we can start by asking, what is right? What do humans perceive as right or wrong? And, and this is such an emotional subject that people tend to just pick a side based on their emotions and they settle on it. So there is likely less factual conversation, more... Quarreling? Exactly. So in a situation like this, we only have two extremes of people because some people see these types of abortions, ones that are performed after the fetus have been found to have a disability, to be morally abhorrent. And others see the prospect of being unable to obtain such an abortion, if it's needed, to be just as abhorrent. How do you win? What is a clear-cut right or wrong? Because each of the opposing side thinks they're right and the other is wrong. Is there any room for in-betweens? Well, I think much of these stems from what you think is mercy. Should it be okay to abort a baby in its third trimester? Because you personally decide its life wasn't worth living. And you decided they feel too much pain. Or is it that you feel more pain letting them live a life that you think isn't worth living? These kind of questions can take a toll on a person. I've seen many cases of teen pregnancies and young people getting abortions as a doctor. And, you know, some are fine. It really depends on the person. But abortions has its cons as well. Oftentimes, we see, and this was according to the latest study published in the Journal of Youth and Adolescence, that adolescent girls who abort unintended pregnancies are five times more likely to seek subsequent help for psychological and emotional problems compared to their peers who carry unwanted pregnancies to term. And these questions you may have, these are the questions that lead you into the spiraling. And this spiraling of questions may keep spiraling for the rest of your life. What is mercy? Am I the one to grant it? Well, that didn't take long to get dark. In cases like these, the parents essentially bring up the question, what is it to be alive? Do I have a life? Or am I just living? I think the answer to those questions nobody can answer right. It's a matter of perspective. Well, it can be, but I personally think the parents and the mother especially should always have the upper hand before the life of someone who isn't born. Even if they're not ready to answer these questions. They're not trying to, they're trying to make a decision for their lives as people who are already living their lives. To keep on living those lives to the fullest. And not bringing more pain into the world. I mean, not just for the baby, but for themselves. Well, that is an excellent point, I'll say. And that seems to be the general consensus on non-voluntary euthanasia, and when we should butt in to decide people's lives. Not exactly with abortions, but with euthanasia of animals and people in vegetative states. Now, I'm no doctor and I haven't had the uh, experience of dealing and being around such circumstances, <laughs> but I have had to unfortunately euthanize a couple of my pets. And it's crazy how we view human life and animal life. To what degree are they similar? Are they inferior? Is that what makes us easily decide for them? Mm -hmm. Is it because we think people who are less intelligent are incapable of knowing what's good or bad for them, like a child or a pet? In my case, I didn't think too deeply on these things when my family had to euthanize our old golden retriever. I was quite young, but I remember thinking, for my dog at least, that this was just something you did, you know? Like, it was kind of a courtesy. Yes, to set them free. free. Yeah. Well, I don't know too much about animals, but the whole deciding for someone we think is not capable for deciding hold true for children as well. Should children have the right to their life? Are they not smart enough to understand whether or not they want to live? 
Is that a choice only granted by intelligence? I think, personally, in these situations, the more intelligent, the person should just evaluate based on the common sense, whether or not a person's life is painful enough. Chances are, if they cannot tell you that they are in pain, they are likely thank you than curse you, if they are granted the chance to be free. Someone in a catatonic state cannot comprehend what is happening to them yet they can still feel the pain associated with their illness. Can't we, as humans, objectively tell whether or not that's living? We don't experience any of the joy or experiences that are associated with living, yet they experience the immense pain that is associated with dying, with none of the relief. In this situation, I think anyone could just use their human sense to decide for somebody. Well, family members of people in vegetative state always decide everything else for them. What makes them stop at such an important decision? Which may be the biggest favor they can, that they can grant them. I think, bringing it back to abortion again, that people who believe fetuses are human, they sort of have this idea, this bore in their minds that they are murderers, like they are not deciding to abort an unwanted fetus, they are killing a child that probably wanted life. The same spore can influence whether or not you want to grant your loved one in a vegetative state euthanasia. They are, well, I personally think they are being selfish. When they step over the bridge of how could I do this? I'll be responsible for their life, they can make a sound decision about what should be done. No one wants to be the Lenny who gets his hopes and dreams shattered only to be murdered by their best friend, but I think more so, no one wants to be the George who has to make the decision and do the deed itself. And sometimes pulling that trigger and ending their life can mean saving their life. I totally agree. In the end, I just don't see the sparing all life argument because some could argue that the people who choose euthanasia they love life so much they can't see themselves leading this painful existence so ending it is a way to liberate life more than living it itself and i want for you to look across that river because i'm going to tell you like you could almost see it uh -huh. Go on, George. We're gonna have a little place. <laughs> We're gonna have a little place. We're gonna have a cow and pig and some chickens. And then down on a flat, we're gonna have a field of alfalfa. For the rabbits. For the rabbits. And I get to tend the rabbits. Tend the rabbits. And we could live off the fat of the lamb. Let's keep looking across that river. Like you can really see. Where? Right there. Can't you almost see? In the end, we can keep spiraling around these questions like a state of dialectic nirvana, but we'll let you do the rest. Beatrice, thank you so much again. This was a tough subject, I'm sure, for you and a lot of other people. Oh, thank you for having me. I think we handled those topics really well. Thank you. We'll see you next time on Why Did the Podcast Cross the Road?